The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. I want to read from the New Testament in Ephesians and chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. I'd encourage you to follow along as I read. Beginning at the first verse, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, forgiving, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Our God and our Father, we bow and humbly pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in seeking to teach the Bible and to believe the Bible and to trust and to obey and we look away from ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are hastening on in our studies in Ephesians, and we have come now to just these three verses. I thought at first to go all the way to 21, but then determined that that would do a disservice, uh, I think, to, to the text. And uh, so, uh, we're looking at uh, this uh, brief paragraph, uh, 15, 16, and 17. In turning to it, there is a point in Pilgrim's Progress, which some of you will recall from your reading, where uh, the path becomes particularly difficult, particularly rough, and uh, a Christian and hopeful, particularly Christian, begins to complain that his feet hurt. And uh, as a result of that, uh, they are discouraged in where they are, and they are then interested in per perhaps finding a, a smoother path upon which they could walk. And soon uh, they spy uh, just such an opportunity in a pleasant little field, according to Bunyan, called Bypath Meadow. And so Christian says to Hopeful, Hopeful, let us step aside into it and walk there. Let's take this smooth path that follows right along, alongside uh, our difficult one. To which Hopeful replies, but what if the path should lead us out of the way? What if we are going to get out of the way by taking this easier path? That is not likely, said Christian. 
And so they go along, and they're feeling a lot better about things. And up ahead, they spy somebody, and the person that is up ahead, Bunyan tells us, is a man by the name of Vain Confidence. They shout to him, Where are you going? He says, I am heading to the celestial city. And that's about the last you hear of him, because he falls into a pit and is swallowed up and, and is out of the story from that point on. As a result of the uh, deterioration in the weather, of the winds that beat upon them and the rain, uh, they end up in their increasing disconsolate uh, position, uh, lying down to sleep, only to waken up and to discover that they have been sleeping in the territory that is owned by giant despair. And giant despair takes them into his custody and puts him in Doubting Castle, as a result of which uh, they remark to one another, who would have thought that this path so pleasant would lead us astray? And they found themselves uh, Bunyan says, in a dark, nasty, stinking dungeon, far from friends, and in a hopeless and pitiable condition. I don't know if you've read Pilgrim's Progress. If not, I hope this whets your appetite or encourages you to go back again. But I read it or refer to it in this way because essentially in that little scene, Bunyan provides an apt illustration of what happens when those who profess to be the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ fail to heed the instruction that Paul provides for us in the verses that are ours to consider. Because Christian and hopeful uh, did not actually look carefully then as to how they were walking, and the decision that they made was not according to wisdom, but it actually was according to foolishness. It's not uncommon on a Sunday morning like this for there to be people here who have said to themselves, this Christian thing is getting a little hard for me, a little tough. I didn't think that the path would be as difficult. I thought it would be more downhill rather than uphill. I didn't imagine that I would encounter these things. And you may have said to yourself, I'm sure there must be a smoother path, an easier path upon which to walk. And uh, just in the same way as uh, when uh, Jonah determined he didn't fancy the idea of the divine assignment and chose his own, uh, there you had a boat ready and waiting for him to go. And when they began to think along these lines, there was a style so that they could make their transition into this easier uh, bypath meadow than walk the hard road. Well, the warning is very, very clear. And the call of these verses is straightforward. It really is reinforcing what we've been noticing from the beginning of chapter 4, where Paul has, having laid down all of these uh, uh, foundational doctrinal truths, has urged his uh, readers uh, to walk worthy of the calling uh, to which they have been called. He reminds them then that they are markedly different from the context out of which they have come and they are now uh, brought into a whole new realm, given a whole new life, and as a result of that, they have an entirely different way of viewing everything, viewing the world and viewing themselves and so on. And so he now tells them what's involved in actually uh, living out the life that he has encouraged them to live. What does it mean to walk in love? How do we do it? How do I walk in light as a child of the light? And so on. Well, he says, let me tell you how. And that's the importance, incidentally, of the third word in your text, if you're using the ESV, in verse 15. Look carefully then. Look carefully then. That ties it back to all that he's been saying. He said, I want to tell you now uh, what is involved in doing what I have been encouraging you to do. Be most careful, then, says the New English Bible, how you conduct yourselves like sensible people and not like simpletons. That brings it home, doesn't it? Don't be dopey. Don't be silly. Don't be simple. Be sensible. So let be careful, he says, so that you don't go wrong in this matter. Now, as we've said all along, and we say again purposefully, Paul is not suggesting that they try and become something that they are not, but rather 
he is encouraging them to increasingly become the people that they are. You were dark, he said. Now you are light. You are to walk as children of light. So then, let me tell you how to do this. Three simple uh, verses. Number one, look carefully, then, how you walk. The verb is to look. The adverb is carefully telling us how to look. Um, Men are dreadfully bad at looking but not seeing. Uh, We are able to uh, look at the very same thing that our wives can see and not see it at all, and then they tell us, why don't you look carefully? Well, I thought I was looking carefully. And then as you get older as well, you get the encouragement. Now look where you're going. Make sure you don't trip and fall. It becomes uh, somewhat embarrassing as time goes by. But nevertheless, it's a good word, isn't it? Look carefully how you walk. Those of you who like to walk, if you like to do hill walking, uh, will have aspired at least to walking in the hills of the Lake District in England. Some of you may actually have done it. You have managed to make it to Helvellyn. And there on Helvellyn, you managed to make it to Striding Edge. And when you found yourself on Striding Edge, you found yourself on one of the most notorious little pieces of real estate for all hill walkers. And you were told by the guide that when you walk along this narrow edge with the quarries down on either side, you better be particularly careful how you walk. Because on a fairly regular basis, annually, there are people who do not take care how they walk. Many of them actually fall to their death. Therefore, to look carefully is wise advice, and it is necessary advice. To look carefully uh, is the opposite of looking carelessly, or of not looking at all, or of looking unthinkingly, or naively, or presumptuously. I can do it. I can do it on my own. I don't need to be careful. I'll be fine. Paul says, now, don't be silly when it comes to this stuff. You look carefully how you walk. Paul is not introducing a new thought. It runs the whole way through the Bible. Jesus spoke about these things when he said there is a broad road, there's a narrow road. You've got to choose where you're going. Uh, The Psalms open with, uh, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in this way, but rather he walks there. The book of Proverbs is filled with encouragements to make sure that wisdom guides your walk. Proverbs 3, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Her ways, referring to the personification of wisdom, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. All right? Uh, Ironically, Christian and hopeful thought that the paths of peace would be found in Bypath Meadow, but that led them into a dark, stinky dungeon. It was the hard road that was the path of pleasantness and of peace, a lesson to be learned. If you have given a verse to one of your youngsters, perhaps signed a Bible for them because of their birthday, you may well have given them Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and understandably so. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Promise. Now, that exhortation is set within this contrast between wisdom and foolishness. And he begins in the negative, doesn't he? Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise. Not as unwise. By nature, the Bible says that we are foolish. We're foolish. It's not very attractive. It doesn't make us sit up in our seats and say, that's wonderful. I'm glad I came here to hear that. But the fact of the Bible, the fact is the Bible is really very straightforward. Uh, For example, the psalmist in Psalm 14 strikingly begins his psalm, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In other words, it is a foolish man who's an atheist. Well, you see, some of the the atheists that are most prominent in our culture today are very, very intelligent. Absolutely. Intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. Wisdom is not the amassing of facts, the gaining of degrees. Wisdom is something that is found, first of all, in knowing God. That's why when Paul tackles it in Romans chapter 1, he says it was behind a facade of wisdom that they became foolish. 
I, I am so intelligent, they said, that I couldn't possibly believe this. And the judgment of the Bible is, no, you're absolutely foolish, because it is a fool. Not somebody—he's not talking about intellectual capacity. He's talking about moral perversity, that the, the perverse response of the human heart to the declaration of God's authority over all affairs in life is to resist it, to say no to it. And so the psalmist makes it clear. It's essentially the effrontery of man saying, I know better than God. You have the very same thing. I, we can delay on it, but for example, in, an, in another psalm, in Psalm 32, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. You get it? Now, some of you are horse people, I know, and you may, you may even be a horse whisperer, for all I know. And I've seen some of that, and I, it's quite remarkable. But I haven't seen so many uh, jockeys uh, whispering to their horses in the Grand National uh, in Liverpool. No, they, they have a very firm grasp of those reins. And all that is actually happening in those moments has to do with a bit and has to do with a bridle. They're not having cozy little conversations as they hasten around the track. They may have had them before. They may have them at the end. But in the midst of it all, it is by a bit and by a bridle. And so the psalmist is saying, as from God, I will give you understanding, and I will give you this, but you mustn't be like a horse or a beast that need to be guided through their existence by means of these external mechanisms. In other words, uh, the reaction of man to God's authority is not simply uh, that uh, we are like sheep who have gone astray, but actually we are guilty of a more forceful waywardness than that. It's true that we've wandered away like sheep, but Jeremiah talks of everyone turning to his own course, turning to her own course, and plunging, plunging headlong into life. I'll do it my way. I've got it covered. I know how this works. You don't need to talk to me about it. You don't really understand. The Bible is an ancient book. We live in the 21st century. We know everything better than the people who ever lived before, and so on and so on it goes. And, and Paul says to the people in Ephesus, now be very careful how you walk and make sure that you are not walking as unwise. Instead of being guided and governed by your own intuition, you need to be guided and governed by the principles of God's Word. But the fool is governed by everything other than the principles of God's Word. Uh, well, what sort of things drive us? Our feelings. Our feelings. I mean, when I just say feelings, I think of that song that they play, you know, feelings, nothing more than feelings. It's a dreadful song, but it's—and it's uh, it says, oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. And some people come to church, and that's their whole deal. They wait. I don't know. I didn't feel it. No. No, I don't think I felt it. No. What, what was it you were trying to feel? And, and do you trust your feelings? Are you going to be guided by what you feel? Are you going to be guided by your desires? Are you going to be guided by your impulses? Driven by those forces? That's the way of foolishness. Because the foolish person is heedless to the Word of God. The foolish person, the Bible says, is focused on the now in a way that doesn't really pay attention to the consequences. Now, for example, at, at the level we're talking of sexual immorality in the previous section, you go to um, uh, Help Me Make It Through the Night uh, by Chris Christopherson, or sung by Christopherson anyway. Yesterday is dead and gone, and tomorrow is out of sight. Let the devil take tomorrow. Tonight I'll take your hand. Help me make it through the night. We don't care about tomorrow. We don't care about yesterday. What we care about is now. 
or switch to Barry Manilow, if you like. I'm just trying to get the feeling again, okay? What operated on that basis, the world hastens on its way. And the Christian stands out as someone who says, let's think about this. Let's not simply adjudicate in the decisions of our lives on the basis of these natural impulses, drives, and so on. Why? Because God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Another element of the foolishness of human wisdom is that, it, as I said, it doesn't pay attention to the consequences. There's no then in it. It's always now. Somebody wrote a book some years ago and sent it to me and said, if you're going to make a decision, you need the three tens in view. In the decision that I'm about to make, ask yourself the question, what, what will be the implication in 10 minutes? What will be the implication in 10 months? And what will be the implication in 10 years? Some of us are making decisions. We don't even have any thought of the consequences in the next 10 seconds. That's not wise. Look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. And one of the things that the Bible does consistently for us is to set the tiny journey of our lives into the great panorama of the eternal purposes of God and into the great uh, drama of the unfolding reality that all of the nows are going to be dealt with in the then, that we are the aggregate of all the little now decisions that we've made, ultimately. And the people who have made the greatest impact in the world in, the, in terms of Christian living are those who have lived there now in relationship to the then. That, incidentally, is why we still know somebody like Murray McShane, who died at the age of, what, 29, as a Presbyterian minister in Dundee, Scotland. McShane, it was said of him, had such a sense of eternity that it impinged upon everything that he did. I read recently that someone had gone to St. Peter's Church in Dundee, uh, where he ministered, and they said, uh, t t show me, show me uh, what it was like uh, when, McSh when McShane was here. And the man said, okay. And he took him to the pulpit, and he said, sit in the seat. Put your elbows on the pulpit. Put your head in your hands and weep. He said, now you've got McShane. What was he weeping for? He's weeping for the congregation to whom he spoke. Unwise, foolish, driven by instinct, desire, the unprofitability of the now. And what he longed for in them, he lived in himself. That's why he wrote, when this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ in glory, looking o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. So you see, the wisdom to which the Bible refers is, again, not merely knowledge, not simply the possession of facts, not an SAT score, not, not a good degree from a fine university. Many, many people have all of that, but they're not wise. It's a wonderful combination when you get genius and wisdom but if you had to choose between the two, choose wisdom. For we have all met individuals in our lives who have been marked by wisdom, uncredentialed individuals. And yet, to be in their company is to know this lady, this lady has learned to look carefully while she walks. She embodies wisdom. She does. Now, that wisdom has to be applied to all of the events of life. And so he goes on in 16 to say it's important that you make the best use of the time, and in light of the fact that the days are evil. 
Now, let's just take that little days are evil um, to, to set it. How, how do we view the world? How do we view the world as Christians? Well, it is a wonderful world. It's a wonderful life, I suppose, as, as, as uh, that man does it. He does that thing at Christmas. And, uh, and uh, I do like uh, Satchmo uh, singing, uh, I see, you know, skies of blue, red roses too. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. And I, and I do. But when I read the news, I, I say, yeah, but there's something really messed up with this place. I mean, you would think after all of this time, we could have got some of this stuff fixed. I mean, we've got all the education. We've got all the scientific ability. We've got all the social agencies. We've got just about every capacity known to man, at least in the Western world. And yet, read the news. What's wrong? Social scientists scramble to give their explanations. The wise man says, you know, we live in days that are evil. Why would the days be evil? Because, says the prophet, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. I wonder, did you see the, uh, the follow-on to uh, some of the material that was done in relationship to the man who was the playboy man? And a couple of days after all of the things had been said and written, one of the journalists in the New York Times, a guy called Ross Douthat, I think, from recollection, had the courage to write an article entitled, An Honest Obituary of a Wicked American. An Honest Obituary of a, wi of a Wicked American. I said to myself, that took a lot of courage, even to use the adjective. No, you see, the Bible is very straightforward in this. And that's why Paul is going to go on in chapter 6 and remind his readers that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, that's where the real drama is taking place. So that when you read the news, when you, when you watch it, as, as we do, as I, as I read just last night, foolishly, before I went to bed, I, I went to sleep. I was actually in bed. But you don't need the details. But I was, uh, I, I was, I was sitting up in bed, and, and I was reading my iPad, and I was reading the London Times for today on Saturday, and, and, and reading there of some character in the Scottish Parliament who was extolling the, the, the fact that Scotland is prepared to lead Europe and perhaps lead the world in relationship to areas that are so counter to the wisdom of God's Word, as it relates to marriage, as it relates to family life, and so on. And in the course of the article, he says, of course, there is entire legitimacy in this because 52 other nations in the world have proceeded to go in this direction. And I started in out to my iPad, are you kidding me? From Scotland, of all places, the land of the book, the place where people said uh, the cities of Scotland will flourish by the preaching of the Word and the, gl and the glorifying of your name. And now I have a somebody there explaining to me at a distance that the nation from which I have come is now going to lead the world in absolute moral perversity and foolishness, and under the disguise of great intelligent decision-making. Why is that? The answer is, Genesis chapter 3, he will bruise your heel, and you will crush his head. All of the strife, all of the antagonism, all of the warfare, all of the broken family life, all of that is ultimately underneath that reality that we are involved in a continual and irreconcilable war. It is then only God-given wisdom that allows us both to view the world as it actually is, then to view ourselves as we actually are, which is a jumble of stuff, of temptations which are alluring, of the weakness of our flesh which is happy to succumb to those temptations, of the opposition that comes from outside of us that says, hey, don't you fancy some of this? Only the Christian is able to say, this is what this is. The, 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 the non-believer says, well, this is just, you know, there's nothing to this. It's, I'm just doing what comes naturally. And the Bible says, yes, we know. That's why it's a problem. 
You see, Paul is writing to those who've been delivered from this present evil age. And he says, because you've been delivered from it, but you still live in it, if you are going to look carefully how you walk, as wise and not as unwise, then one of the ways in which it will be revealed is in the way you make use of time. Time. Time in itself is an interesting question, isn't it? Philosophers and scientists have been fiddling with time for all of time, and, and many are, are, are just as, as bewildered by it as when they first pondered it. Well, you say, well, that's sort of high level. Yeah, but the high level stuff always bleeds down into the culture. So, for example, James Taylor, who is, uh, is one of the fine uh, lyricists of uh, my generation, in a, in a song called The Secret, it's the, as they call The Secret of Life, not The Secret of Life, it's so apostrophe. Uh, this, is, this is how it begins. The secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. Any fool can do it. There ain't nothing to it. Nobody knows how we got to the top of the hill, but since we're on our way down, we might as well enjoy the ride. Now, the thing about time is that time isn't really real. It's just your point of view. How does it feel for you? Einstein said he could never understand it at all planets spinning through space, the smile upon your face, welcome to the human race. Some kind of lovely ride. I'll be sliding down. I'll be gliding down. Try not to try too hard. It's just a lovely ride. Sliding down, gliding down, sliding all the way down into the darkness of the grave, before one is raised to stand before the face of the one who made us for a relationship with himself and who loved us despite our rebellion and disinterest to the extent that he would send his only son on a rescue mission to penetrate the darkness, to live in the darkness, to bear the slide down, to bear the punishment, in order that we might then be able to say, what a remarkable thing. Surely then, if Christ has done all this for me, I better be careful about all the stuff he's given me, and particularly time. Time. Money's not the issue. Time's the great issue. Time may not be money, or time may be money, but money can buy time. We can't add a single moment to our lives. That's what Jesus said. He said to his disciples in Matthew, didn't he? He says, why, why are you anxious? Which of you, by being anxious, could add, a single, uh, could add a single hour to his life? You can't. In fact, by being anxious, you might actually remove hours from your life. And yet still we try. So what does it mean to redeem the time? Because that's really the picture here. What does it mean to buy back the time? What does it mean to take the opportunity? Now, don't fall foul of the idea that what it means is you're supposed to uh, go away and, and get into, quotes, full-time ministry. So that that means there's a very few people who actually do the thing, and the rest just come along for the ride. No, we're all involved in full-time ministry. It's a full-time ministry being a mom. It's a full-time ministry being a banker. It's a full-time ministry being a carpenter. It's a full-time ministry being a nurse. It's a full-time ministry being a poet. It's a full-time ministry in Christ. There's only one life. It'll soon be la passed, and only what's done for Jesus will last. That doesn't mean only what's done on Sunday will last. It means everything that we do in all of our life, all of our time, to the glory of God, is to seize the opportunity and to recognize that time itself is a gift. It's not just a lovely ride, and we do know what it means because God created time. Before there was time, before there was anything, there was God. The fact that Einstein was brilliant but couldn't get that is because he was brilliantly foolish in biblical terminology. Do you know the old advertisement from the newspaper of an earlier era in the lost and found column? Lost yesterday, somewhere between sunrise and sunset, two golden hours, each set with 60 diamond minutes, no reward offered, 
for they are gone forever. Now, you see, when we look carefully, not as unwise but as wise, when we realize the context in which we live, then we realize we better not be playing fast and loose with the time that we have, so that it is an investment. How do you buy back the time? What is the key, if you like? What is the coin? What is the currency? Self-discipline. Self-discipline. As opposed to, hey, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like the evening service. No. Really? You know what? There's many an afternoon I don't feel like it either. And I, I had to listen to myself three times. You only did it once. <laughs> and furthermore, I know I'm going to have to listen to myself a fourth time. I don't feel like it either. What's feeling got to do with it? What, 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 what coin do you use to buy the opportunity? Self-discipline. The discipline that comes under the rule of Christ. I don't say that as a—it just so happened that the evening service came to mind, but there's no, there's no legalism in, in my thinking in relationship to that. You can't you can justify sermon times out of the Bible. You can probably justify the evening service out of the New Testament a lot easier than you can the morning services, but we'll leave that for, the, for another day. That could be a question for tonight. But here's, here's the point, that we are not to be foolish— but we are to understand in these things what the, what the will of the Lord is. Once again, you see, he comes back to it, the contrast between a wise person and a foolish person. Don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, how do we understand what the will of the Lord is? Back up in verse 10, remember he said, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, when you think about the will of God, you can think about it in two ways, one in general terms and one in particular terms. Most, most of us get tied up with this particular thing. Well, I didn't, I, am I supposed to marry him or marry her or not marry at all? Should I buy the Toyota with the thing, or should I get the Ford? Will I get this? Should I put my house there? What am I going to do there? You sit around for the rest of your life trying to figure that out, and you can read your Bible backwards or forwards, and you'll never find the answer to the question in the Bible, because it isn't in there. Oh, you said, that doesn't sound right. Let me tell you what is in there. The principles are in there, which we then, which are universal principles, which are then used by us when we understand, when we think, when we discern, when we apply. So you have principles of God's Word that are then to be applied to the practicalities of life. God is interested in all of these things. And that's where, again, our understanding of the Bible comes in. That's where our understanding of fellowship comes in. That's where our understanding of taking good counsel comes in, so that we're not sitting around waiting for the feeling to get us in our tummy to know what it is we're supposed to do next. No, don't be foolish, but instead understand what the will of the Lord is. What is ultimately the will of the Lord for the Christian? To make us like Jesus. Bottom line, beginning and end of the whole program. That is his purpose from all of eternity that he purposed those whom he predestined, he also called to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what he did. Ephesians 1, 4. He has taken you and done this in and through you in order, Ephesians 1, 4, to make you holy. Not to make you happy. Make you holy. 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the will of God for you, even your sanctification. It's the same thing. One day when we see him, we will be made like him, and the program will have been brought to completion. In the meantime— there are lots of decisions to be made. Shall I live in Cleveland, Ohio? Shall I continue to live in Cleveland, Ohio? Shall I move here? Shall I move there? What shall I do? Shall I retire? Shall I not retire? You can't go in here and find Alistair, retire on the 27th of November. It doesn't say it in there. So how would I know? Principles! Same way that you would know. If you don't do it that way, the danger is that you and I will both end up with Christian and hopeful, walking down the soft path, thinking this is groovy, and ending up in a stink, stinky, dark dungeon. You see, the will of God is perfect. It's perfect. It's not just good. It's perfect. His will in relationship to marriage, in terms of moral purity and, and, and all of that, is perfect. 
His purposes in singleness are absolutely perfect. His plans for all these things are perfect plans. And it is an effrontery to God to say, no, I know better than God when it comes to this stuff. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no thrill in life like being in the will of God. Let me finish in this way. In the 1970s, mid-70s, late 70s, 1978, terrorists came from Mozambique across the border into Zimbabwe to Rhodesia, as it was then. They came across the border, and in the midst of all of their attacks, they attacked the Emmanuel Mission School. In the Emmanuel Mission School, they bayoneted to death eight adults, four children. The youngest child was only three months old. They butchered them and left them alone. One other girl, who had also been abused physically, sexually, and in this way, managed to drag herself out of the compound. She died seven days later after a, a vain attempt to restore her to health. I know all of this because I read it in Time magazine, but I know all this because Mary Fisher, that girl, was my friend. She died at the age of 28 in 1978, as a result of investing her life, bringing the principles of God's Word to bear upon her life, and believing that it would be right for her to go to Rhodesia to serve in the Pentecostal Mission School and teach children about Jesus. So she learned from one of my black brothers who was at school with us the Shona language in preparation for going there, and there she went, and within two years she was dead. She then had all her belongings, which finally were taken back to her parents, who did not believe. And when they gathered up her belongings, one of the things that they found was music, cassette tapes, as it was then, that were cassettes of her teaching the children, singing in Shona language, other things about Jesus. And uh, there, I can imagine what it was like to have heard it, because I only read it. But there was her lilting Welsh voice playing her guitar and singing, teaching the children in their own language these words, to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain, to hold his hand and walk his narrow way. There is no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Perhaps you're here today, and you've never stepped out in trust and in obedience to follow after Christ, to come to him and tell him that he is the very Savior that you know you so desperately need, that you've heard his voice, and that you want to trust and obey. Then do so. The promise of God's Word is that whoever comes to him, he will never turn away. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with all who believe today and forevermore. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.